Good evening, everybody. Boy, that's, I feel so powerful with this microphone on. It, it, it just commands attention. I'll get it any way I can, you know, whatever it takes. Well, thanks so much for being here tonight. I thought we would open up with a word of prayer. And uh, if, if anybody, like I said, if you don't have a notebook, there's plenty of them back there for everybody to have their own. So feel free to jump and jump in and grab one. And let me say a word of prayer for us. Father, it's just such a joy and honor um, to be able to do what we're doing tonight. And God, it's, it's a... It's encouraging to see so many people here, Lord, that are willing to go deeper and to jump into uh, the deep end of the pool and go through a subject like this. Lord, you gave us your word as, as a love letter to us to let us know more about you, to um, understand you in ways that we would never, ever have known you. And Lord, you've disclosed yourself to us. And God, I pray that we would better understand you and your word, that we would love you more as a result of what we talk about tonight and in the evenings to come. I pray that we would want to share you more as a result of what we're learning here. I pray that we would uh, not take for granted that we have a copy of your word and it's so readily available. And Lord, now in, in so many languages, so it's accessible to so many people. And Lord, I ask that we, um, after a long, hard day, Lord, that many people have had, that you would freshen their mind, that um, we would have some good, engaging conversation tonight, that would be interactive. And Lord, we do all this to your glory. It's the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, again, welcome. Thanks for being here. We are going to jump in and... Let me throw out a term here right, right out of the gate, see if you've heard of this before. Has anybody ever heard, are we, are we up, is the PowerPoint going? I, you know what, there's a PowerPoint on, um, it's got today's date on it, Tyler, I'm sorry. Okay, well Tyler's working out the technical difficulties. Has anybody ever heard the phrase post-truth politics? Post-truth politics. This is not in your notes yet. I'm just introducing stuff. But uh, yeah, we're in this age of, they call it post-truth politics. And it's, it's been defined like this. Uh, post-truth post politics is a political culture, this is from Wikipedia, a political culture in which debate is framed largely by appeals to emotion, disconnected from the details of policy, and by the repeated assertion of talking points to which factual rebuttals are ignored. So, does that sound at all familiar to you? And, oh, here we go. There's, there's what I just, uh, this, and by, we're not in the notes just yet. But um, we're in this, uh, what this guy, Ralph Keyes, he came up with this. He said, we're living now in what he calls the post-truth era. And he wrote a book by that title. And let me ask you, is anybody really surprised by that? That we're living in the post-truth era. Now, what challenge does that present to the subject matter that we're going to be talking about over the next 10 weeks or so? Yeah, so my question was, what, just the fact that we're living in the post-truth era, what challenge does that present in what we're going to be talking about over the next several, several weeks? Yes, Anita. Yeah. Okay, right on. Yeah, when you start talking about a post-truth era, and, you, and, and then you're going to dive into a subject like the scriptures, immediately you find yourself in this cultural conundrum. Because if there's anything the scriptures scream, it is absolute truth. 
So it's, it becomes an issue when you start talking about the Bible in this post-truth era that, that we're talking about. And the issue in the culture has to do with, uh, you know, with whether or not even truth exists. But then, as Christians, what is our ultimate authority? And what does the word authority mean? And what is the difference between the authority that the, as the Protestants recognize it and the authority as the Roman Catholic Church recognize it? Because as you'll see tonight, it's not the same thing. It's two different ideas of what authority means. So we're not surprised we live in this post-truth era. But let me ask you something. As you were driving here tonight, you probably passed some other churches. You probably passed maybe a Presbyterian church, maybe a Methodist church, maybe a non-denominational church, uh, maybe a congregational church, maybe a church that's charismatic. So churches that we have some differences with. And yet, in just about all those churches, we're all reading the same Bible. So what does it mean to believe in the Scriptures as absolute truth, and yet us and these other churches have different ideas of what that Bible is saying? So when we, if you look on the cover of that notebook, it says there's two words. The second word, I think... I think this is what you have. Yeah. What's that big word that starts with an H on the cover of the notebook? Hermeneutics. What in the world? Can somebody tell me what, is, what does that word mean? And we have, by the way, some people, um, we're, we're putting this online. And just so other people can hear uh, what's going on, we've got a microphone up here, and we can pass it around if we need to. But if you've got a question later on, if you want to come up and you can ask at the mic, or, we can, or you can take it back with you just so other people can hear. But just what does that word hermeneutics mean? I'd, I'd pay a lot of money to a seminary to learn what that word meant. <laughs> you said it, Anita. You said it. <laughs> Interpretation. Yeah. Your hermeneutic is the way in which you interpret the Bible. So we're going to be learning about not just the Scriptures but also how to interpret the scriptures. So let's keep moving forward. Um, one of the reasons I love to, and again, I'm not in the notes just yet, I'm still introducing, but one of the reasons I love to study um, theology and ask this question, well, why are we doing this? I mean, a lot of people, when they hear, that, when they hear words like doctrine or theology, you immediately get a, a yawn reaction. You know, why, why are we doing this? Why is it necessary? I want to read a quote to you. Um, this is from a guy who wrote a book called Our Legacies named John Hanna. He makes an argument for uh, studying theology and the history of the church. And he says, "As a knowledge of the history of doctrine will provide a bulwark against pride and arrogance born of the thought that any one church or ecclesiastical tradition stands in the exclusive heritage of first century orthodoxy. Let's just sit with that. Let's sit... Okay, a bulwark is like a guard. It's like a, um, you know, a wall to keep out the invaders, the bad people. So he says, a knowledge of the history of doctrine will provide a bulwark against pride and arrogance, born of the thought that any one church or ecclesiastical tradition, that'd be like you know, the Greek Orthodox tradition or some church tradition, stands in the exclusive heritage of first century orthodoxy. So, what does that mean? There's no one true church. There's no one true church. Interesting. Okay. That's a good response. That'll get the ball rolling. Surely somebody's upset at what Mr. Bowers just said. Is anybody... Are you saying First Baptist Church of Sheridan... Is not the, we don't have the rights to truth above and beyond every other church out there? We're probably closer. <laughs> We're closer. I, yeah, that's, I'll take that. Thank you, Gary. I think, I think the key there is when we have arrogance. Okay. Yeah. You know, Hold on. Hold that thought. You're, let me get you this microphone, man, because you're... You're getting ready to say some stuff that the world needs to hear. I was just going to say, uh, oh, yeah, sound guy doesn't know this. Um, I was just saying that they were greeted, but the button came off. Uh, I think you just saw that one as a teeny tiny. Yeah, but it's, it's not good. 
Oh, there you go. There we go. I was just going to say that uh, to me the key is arrogance and that you're trying to guard against the arrogance that you would have um, since you're not knowing the history of the church and that when you learn that history, you understand why the church you're in has come to its beliefs. Okay. Yeah, I, I think in, in understanding why your church has come into its beliefs and churches have their own peculiar traditions. They don't like to think they do. They, most of us believe that the quote-unquote traditions we have, well, those aren't traditions, that's just biblical, right? That's what we tend to believe. But if you actually go back and think that we are operating the same, the same way a first century church does, you'd find huge differences in how we do things right now, you know, some 20 centuries later and how they did things back then. Thank you. Um, and then um, in addition to that, they're actually finding, has anybody heard of this podcast called Who Killed Mars Hill? Okay, yeah. It's about, you know, Mark Driscoll and the death of a megachurch called Mars Hill. And they're exploring, well, why did it fall? What happened here? And they're starting to uncover this, this, unfortunate, um, this, this unfortunate kind of continued issue of churches becoming narcissistic. And a church, one of the things that makes a church narcissistic, if they believe they have the exclusive grip on truth, more so than all the other churches around them. And that's one of the reasons it's important that we go back and we look at the history of, well, how did we get to where we are? So as we're going through the material on, on the Bible and on how we interpret the Bible, we're going to look at it through a historical lens. Well, how did we get to where we are today? Because it's a lot messier of a road than you may think it is when you start understanding how we got our beliefs about the Bible that we have today. So I've always loved church history. And this material, this is um, what we're doing, is something put out by a group called Credo House. Um, they, they take stock in making sure as we study theology, we're also understanding like historically how we got to where we are today. Because it's really important. And you know, the journey to becoming the post-truth era is a long journey. I mean, if you, if you think it's just been the past hundred years, you're wrong. We were set up hundreds of years ago to be where we're at today in, in this post-truth era era that we're in. So, uh, yeah, I think in, you know, why are we doing this? We want to guard against pride. Um, a knowledge of the history of doctrine will provide a bulwark against pride. Uh, and, it's, and we want to be careful claiming a biblical precedent for all we do. Again, we tend to think that everything we do, I mean, down to Sunday school and down to... Um, how we do communion. Well, this is the way they did it in the early church. You know, this is the way Jesus did it. He drank juice out of a tiny little cup, a little square wafer, because it's the right way to do it. And then secondly, we want to focus on the timeless truth. But the, the only way we can find that truth is to dig for it. And that's what we're looking for. Every church does things that don't necessarily have a biblical precedent, like music style and things like that. And... Um, before we go uh, chiseling something, for example, in the walls around here, I'm always very cautious about what we choose to, to put up. We need to go asking, what are we hanging here? Is this a timeless truth, or is this, is this kind of gimmicky? I'm always very fearful of church slogans. So what is the timeless truth? The gospel of scriptures, we want to keep the Bible at the center of all we do. So, let's keep going. And now we're going to get into that notebook that you have. And, uh, you know, we're, this is, I put bibliology and interpretation instead of hermeneutics on this, this slide right here. But we're going to be studying the Bible as an ancient text. So, right here at the get-go, what, what I'm hoping is that we could lay aside some assumptions that we have. Um, we don't want to enter in a class like this thinking that we already know everything about the Bible, that we already have everything right, uh, that we have the same Bible as everybody else. We're going to talk about inspiration and inerrancy. 
What do those words mean? We're going to talk about how do you interpret different genres of Scripture. Do you interpret the book of Psalms the same way you interpret the book of Revelation? Um, and then what about current issues interpretation? Current issues in interpretation. There are current issues in interpretation of the Bible that we're going to talk about. They come up cyclically. And I hope that when you walk away from this study that we're going to be doing, that you have a greater confidence that the Bible that you have in your hands is one that was um, put on paper 2,000 years ago. That the books that you have in uh, your Bible are the ones that we're intended to have. Because, for example, the books, the, um, the, the Bible the Roman Catholics have, is not the same as the Protestants. There's books in that that we don't have. Why is that? We'll, we'll get there. And I hope that you'll appreciate the struggle through church history in interpreting the Bible. How many of you believe that there's going to be a rapture followed by a seven-year tribulation, followed by a 1,000-year millennial reign of, of Christ on earth? Yeah, most of, us, most of us believe that. But do you know that that idea is just, it's just a few hundred years old? Prior to that, that is not how they really thought things are going to go down in the end. Now, I believe that. Uh, I used to be a 10 out of 10 on belief that that's how things were going to go down. I will tell you, as the years go by, I don't have a 10 out of 10 on how things are going. I like the way David Jeremiah says it. He said, that's the way I believe it's going to happen until it doesn't happen that way. <laughs> that's kind of where I'm at with that. But they've struggled. They struggled for centuries over how do you interpret the book of Revelation. They've struggled with that, and, and, and we still struggle with that. Um, okay, there's a couple of books, actually. So in your notebook, you'll see that this, this can very much be set up like, like a class, like you would take in college or something like that. I have never done one of these classes that way. If you want to do the scripture memorization and you want to, if you're just really, you know, wanting to do this for a grade, you are welcome to do it. Memorize the scriptures, do the readings. I think that um, only good would come of that. There's case studies and things as well. I just, I'm probably not going to give you quizzes and things like that. We're just going to, we're going to work our way through this. Probably not. But probably, I mean, No. You want, okay, we, somebody here wants it, wants the quizzes and the tests. Sorry. Yeah. There's also something, there's a um, bibliology on page Roman numeral 10, and there's some really good books listed. I want to emphasize two books on that list. Where is it? One of them is called The Journey from Texts to Translations. If you don't have this book, it's a really good one to understand how we got the Bible we have today. You know, what are the ancient manuscripts that are still in existence and, and which ones aren't? Um, where are they? Uh, how sure of themselves was the early church when it came to determining what books should go in the final canon? So this is a good one to have. It's called The Journey from Text to Translations by Paul Wegner. I'd say this is kind of a reference book. It's almost kind of like an encyclopedia sort of a deal. The other one is called, if you've never read the book, um, Living by the Book, Learning How to Interpret the Bible, a new inductive Bible study, that's a really good one to have too. So I'll, I'll emphasize those two out of this list. Uh, the... Um, that Wayne Grudem, Systematic Theology, at the top of the page, we don't have really required reading in here. That's a good one to have, too. Uh, if you don't have Grudem, Systematic Theology, that's a really good reference. And if you want, there's another one. How to Read the Bible is Literature Under Suggested Reading on Hermeneutics by Riken. These are more advanced books. And some of these I have and some of them I don't. So I, I can emphasize some, of the, some over others. And then that very last one on Roman numeral 12, the one called, by Roy Zook called Basic Bible Interpretation. That's a good one to have on your shelf too. So. The second one after Wegner, you Riken, 
how to read the Bible as literature. On the bottom of the letter. Yeah, under suggested reading hermeneutics. So when you go to seminary, the, you, the first class you take was with Howard Hendricks on inductive Bible study. And he wrote the book called Living by the Book. And these, some of these are suggested or actually required books for like an entry-level seminary student. The book by Riken, um, the book by Howard Hendricks, and the book by Roy Zook are all really good. Any questions so far? There's some other good suggested um, books in there. Some of them are good just to have on your shelf. That on page uh, Roman numeral 14, I think that's XIV. Uh, that one, the two volume commentary by Wolverd and Zook called the Bible Knowledge Commentary, is a fantastic Old and New, comment, Old and New Testament commentary to have. It's just two volumes, and I reference that book before I prepare. I mean, I'm in that book every single week, two or three times a week. It's really helpful. Is there a certain version of the Bible that we should be reading? Good question. Is there a certain version of the Bible you should be reading? So this curriculum would suggest um, the ESV, the English Standard Version, the uh, New American Standard Version, the New International Version, and uh, there was one more, NASB, NET, NIV, and NASB. Those are four good ones. I, my favorite is the NET, the New English Translation. Not many people have it. I, I preach out of the English Standard Version. But the New English Translation in the Bible itself, it, when, you, when you get it, it it's, it's a thick book because it's got a ton of notes in it. But it walks you through every decision that the translators made. So when you read an NIV and you read an NASB and there's like, well, why don't they marry up exactly? Well, that's because the translators had to make decisions on words that don't translate it easily from, from either Greek to English or Hebrew to English. So I like the net. I just don't usually preach out of it. Patty, you had a hand up? Somebody give, give this man a microphone and just... The best Bible to read is the one you're going to read. <laughs> hey, just drop the microphone, Dennis. Just drop it. Mic drop moment. Yeah. I, uh, and you know, I, the, the King James isn't on the list, but I, a lot of people, you know, they have a, you know, they do the King James. That's cool. Um, I have a hard time understanding the King James version. I just really do. So, yeah, good question. Good question, Tawny. Is it Tawny? It's Tawny, yeah. I almost called you Tammy. It's Tawny. Okay. Okay. Uh, any other questions? I like the way you're thinking. I like the way you're thinking. So, every scripture is inspired by God and useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the person dedicated to God may be capable and equipped for every good work. So that is the essence. That's why it's so important that we are in the Scriptures, because it is so important. It is there to equip us in what God is calling us to do. So that's why we do a class in bibliology and, and hermeneutics. That's why we go into the deep end of the pool, because we believe that the Bible is valuable. Uh, it is there to equip us. Next slide I want to go into is an outline of this class. So we're going to spend some time um, tonight on this idea of authority. What are we talking about when we talk about authority? Who has it? Has it always been the New Testament? Uh, and then the next class we'll talk about sola scriptura, why that's so important. That's one of the cries of the Reformation. We'll also talk about the transmission of Scripture. In other words, how has it been moved through time? How did it start? Where did it get its beginnings? And then how did each successive generation get a copy of it? How did you get a copy of it? How difficult is it when most people are illiterate? You know, the first 15, I mean, for the first 1,500 years, 
Most people couldn't read. By the way, that's why they had stained glass windows in churches, because that was telling the story of Scripture in those stained glass windows. Um, we'll talk about the canonization of the Old and New Testament. How did they decide which books, which writings should be part of the Old Testament and then which ones should be part of the New Testament? What does inspiration mean? What does it mean that the Bible was inspired? And then how do you prove it? Uh, what about inerrancy? What do we mean when we say inerrancy? You know, I almost brought, I've got a Bible, it's back in my office that has the book of 2 Samuel in it twice. Oh, I had one once that didn't have any Genesis. It didn't have Genesis in it. Yeah. See? Should we, I mean, are we supposed to burn it? Are we supposed to, you know, is that heretical? I, I, I called them and I said, what do I do? And they said, um, you could give it to your pastor. <laughs> yeah. So I did, and he just so happened to have the same Bible, so he gave me his, and I... Oh, that was super nice. Yeah. I would never have I done that. Very cool. Um, we'll talk about the history of interpretation. Let me tell you, that, might, that is one of the most fascinating subjects, in my opinion, is how people have interpreted the Bible differently against different historical backdrops. It's amazing. If you don't think what's going on in your culture at the time impacts how you look at the Bible, let me tell you, think again, because it absolutely does. Do you think, how many people, how many pastors did you hear preaching sermons about how Russia was this part, you know, fulfilled this role in the book of Revelation? You don't hear that so much anymore, do you? Why is that? Now it's China. Now it's China. Why is that? Because China's rising to power. It has always impacted how we interpret the Bible. It gives me chills to think about how um, much our world and our country and our government impacts how we look at, read, and interpret the scriptures. And then finally, we'll talk about what do we mean by historical grammatical hermeneutics. When we interpret the Bible, we're taking into account history. We're taking into account the way the sentence is set up in the Bible. All of those things have an impact on how we interpret the scriptures. And I think you'll gain a really, uh, a, a much deeper appreciation for what it takes to interpret the Bible. It is back-breaking, it is excruciating work, and there's so much at stake. So, um, you know, what we're after is to try to figure out, is the book we have accurate to the original? You know, is it accurate to the original? So here's just kind of a collage of things we'll be looking at and studying. What is the Apocrypha? What does mechanical dictation mean? Um, what is revelation and inspiration? LXX, what in the world is, what does the significance of those letters LXX? Somebody, somebody Extra knows. Large. Extra large. <laughs> I think that's XXL. <laughs> they just got it. A dyslexic person put that in there, didn't they? The phrase regula fide, you know, all of these, what, what happens is we are putting these words into practice even when we don't know it. These words right here are in, uh, impacting our lives without us even knowing it. So we'll dig in and find out what that means. Keep on trucking here. All right, so let's dig into session one. Authority. The question is, who do we trust? I mean, that's really the question. Who do we trust? So a few questions, and we'll try to get through as much as... I was going to go to about 8.15. Is that cool with everybody? Does that work? All right. Okay. Uh, what does that phrase mean? Actually, it means... Does anybody know what sola scriptura means? Scripture alone. Scripture alone. Okay. We'll talk about what is the Roman Catholic understanding of tradition. What does Eastern Orthodoxy believe concerning tradition? And then what is the difference between sola scriptura, sola scriptura and solo scriptura? Two different ideas. Um, so, you know, what does it mean? If I, were to, if I were to say, if I were to ask you, is scripture, the idea of scripture alone, is that important? Okay, we all agree it's important. 
that Scripture is authoritative. But does that impact you when you go to the grocery store? It should. Okay, it should. How, how does it? How? Well, if they run out of milk and you're, you're following the, la- the lady that got the last one, you might have a little attitude. <laughs> <laughs> it may keep you from slugging somebody. Yeah. But it doesn't necessarily tell you whether to buy the Chiquita or Dole Bananas. So it does have a bearing, but maybe not in. Does it speak to every situation, right? Gary. It means to pay for what you get. That's definitely a biblical idea. Maybe don't buy your dinner at the liquor store. Are they offering dinner these days? Last time. It depends on what you're doing. So before we go any further, too, let's talk for just a moment about where that phrase came from. So if you want to understand, well, why is Scripture alone so important in our lives? We have to know a little bit about um, something called the Reformation. So who, just tell me, who's the main figure of the Reformation? Martin Luther. Martin Luther. So Martin Luther, he's, he's like a Protestant hero. Not so much a hero to the Catholics, but he's definitely a Protestant hero. And it was helpful for us. The Catholics, he did make some reforms for the Catholics as well. They just wish he'd stayed like within the confines of the church. They, they got really upset when he went outside the church and felt like he was criticizing from the outside of the church. And also some would say, but we see him as a hero. Now some would say he's quite neurotic. Does anybody know what Luther was absolutely neurotic about? He was neurotic about his own sin. He was obsessed with it. He was constantly afraid that he was going to go to hell. He was just terrified. And it it really impacted even his digestive system. Like he was in the bathroom all the time. They found what they think was the outhouse that he spent a lot of his time in studying. Because he was so neurotic, it affected him physically. He was scared he was going to hell. He was a very anxious man. And back when Martin Luther was around... Um, the best way to kind of make sure you were going to go to heaven was to become a monk. So he became a monk. He just wanted to like, you know, kind of like, you know, if somebody was unsure of whether or not they were a good Christian, maybe they'd run out and become a missionary. I don't recommend that. But if kind of you wanted to, you know, seal the deal, that's what he thought he was doing by becoming a monk. And then there was a horrible thunderstorm and he made some promises to God. And um, that kind of set him on this course of, of being a monk. And he had a mentor named, and I think I'm pronouncing this correctly, Johann von Staupitz. And Johann von Staupitz saw Luther, and he saw how just tore up he was over his own sin. And he made a really unusual suggestion to Luther. He said, Luther, what you need to do is you need to go to this Bible college, this, you know, this school, and you need to become a professor, and you need to start preaching. He felt like that, diving into the scriptures in that way, would just help him get over this, uh, this issue he had with his, his own fear and, and turmoil. As a matter of fact, Luther was known to confess his sins for up to six hours a day. Didn't he just, know about Jesus? He knew about Jesus, but he was obsessed with his sin. And somebody knew he, he didn't have it. He wasn't seeing it rightly. So he, um, he gets his doctorate, starts studying, he starts preaching, um, he assumed the chair of the professor of, in, in Bible of this university he was at. And he still had this inner fear. It's this, um, he calls it, this is the German word, anfuchtung. Uh, anfuchtung, I think I'm saying it, A-N-F-E-C-H-T-U-N-G. And the tra- it's a hard word to translate into English. And it's best described as a trial sent by God to test man or an assault by the devil to destroy man. But that's how seriously he carried um, his faith and what he believed. He always felt like he was being assaulted. And, and all that doubt and turmoil and tremor and panic and, and despair, all this was invading him. And he went and studied him, and he became this professor and preacher. And as he studied with the fervor that he had, you can see the fervor this man has, he started seeing some differences between what the church was teaching and what was actually in the Bible. And it was getting to him. And he wanted to uh, challenge some things. He started thinking maybe the church was wrong on some issues. That was unheard of. I mean, the church was the safeguard of truth. 
You wouldn't have thought about challenging the church on anything. But the more he studied, the more it bothered him. Finally, he wrote out, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> he wrote out a list of 95 issues that he had with the church. You know, things like, well, what's up with the Pope? Um, what's the deal with all these doctrines about Mary? The biggest deal for Martin Luther. Does anybody know what was the biggest deal for Martin Luther? The selling of indulgences. Yeah, that the Catholic Church could sell you a piece of paper to ensure you a, a place in heaven, that your sins were forgiven. So he took issue with all those things. And finally, uh, the Pope heard about this, this list of issues he had. He, he hammered it to the uh, door of a church in Wittenberg, Germany. The Pope heard about it. and was like, well, who is this guy? And they summoned him to a, a council. It was called a diet at the time. They summoned him to this and said, look, you need to recant of these issues. Now, Martin Luther just wanted to have a conversation. Yeah, he didn't want to go up against the church. He's like, well, I just want to talk about this. But they call him into this, this meeting. They said, I want you to recant. They had all of his teachings laid out on the table. And they, they told him, you know, recant or, or bad things are going to happen. I mean, they, you know, people are getting burned alive. And he said, give me a day to think about it. Has anybody ever seen the movie Luther? I tell you, their depiction of the night before he was, you know, between when he said, give me a day to think about it, and the next day when he was actually going back before the council, it's powerful what this guy went through. It was like he was being chased around the room by the devil is how he described it. So they said, give me a day to think about it. Um, now, the understanding, you know, he was challenging everything about the church. He was challenging the idea that the Pope was the successor to Peter, right? So the reason the Roman Catholic Church has a Pope was the idea, well, Peter, was, it says, was given the, the, um, the keys to heaven. And, well, somebody's got to keep the keys to heaven, so the next person Peter discipled, they had the keys to heaven. And eventually you have this office of the Pope. Well, he's challenging all this. And he went on to say, yeah, the church isn't the church any longer the way you all are doing it. Now, remember, he's, he's a nervous guy, and he's challenging this entire structure of the church. There were no, no denominations at the time. I mean, the church was the church. This was, this was it. And he is going up against it. Remember, you know, if you thought he had stomach issues before, now he, like, can't get out of the bathroom. So, and, and it's true that he spent that whole night just about on the toilet. He was so upset about what was, he was going to have to do the next day. So he made a life-changing decision. He's got a lot of followers. He goes the next day before the council again. They ask, will you recant? And this is what he says. This is one of the most powerful statements in church history. He says, unless I am convinced by the testimony from Scripture or by evident reason, for I confide neither in the Pope nor in a council alone, since it is certain that they have often erred and contradicted themselves. I am held fast by the scriptures adduced by me, and my conscience is held captive by God's word. And I neither can nor will revoke anything, seeing it is not safe or right to act against conscience. God help me. Amen. So he just said, i got to go for it. He said, I can see the truth. I cannot recant. He's expressing, I think, a great deal of humility in this statement, but he can't do what the church is asking him to do. If you read some of his later writings, by the way, he gets kind of more arrogant. Like He takes this stand, knees shaking. However, later on, he's kind of got a following, and he's more confident that he's right. He gets a little more arrogant. Um, so he said... This is where I stand. I can do no other. And then the, ref the Protestant Reformation happens. By the way, Protestant's not a great title. We're protesters. Well, what are we protesting? Well, we've been given this identity as the protesters of the Roman Catholic Church. So five cries, five solas came out of that, that Reformation. By faith alone, by grace alone, by Christ alone, by Scripture alone. And there was one more, I think by the Holy Spirit alone. But um, five views came out of the, the Reformation in regard to the Scriptures. I'm sorry, in regard to authority. 
and we'll go through these. One was sola ecclesia, uh, the church alone. One is prima scriptura, the scriptures are primary. One's called the regula fide, that means the rule of faith. Sola scriptura, the scriptures alone. Then solo scriptura. So let's talk about what these different views mean. But first of all, let's talk about tradition, because that's an important part of the conversation. What is tradition? Before we look at the dictionary definition, somebody, could somebody step up to the microphone and just tell us, when you hear the word tradition, what is it that you think of? We can even pass around the mic. Here, I'll be the... What do you think of? I'd say it's something your forefathers have done and you've continued on. Okay, something that, that's great. Something the forefathers did that you continued on. Somebody else? Yes, Mr. Moore. Wedding ceremonies. Okay, that's a good example. Tradition of marriage. A wedding ceremony? Yeah, you, you, uh, we tend to have a way we do them, right? There's an aisle, they walk down, to, they come back together. <clears throat> good, what else? Mr. Ludicaus, you have. Doing something for the sake of doing it because your family's always done it. That's the way it's always been done. It's the right way. You put a few pennies in the cabbage pot on New Year's Day, right? That's what we did back in West Virginia. Yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking it's a mindset or a way of thinking that continues over time. Okay. So it's often not questioned. Okay. And a couple of people like us in here who question a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not a bad thing. Any other ideas? A tradition? I think we hit the... Uh... Yes, Brian. It's a collection of practices that become culturally meaningful. Ooh, say that in the <laughs> microphone. It's a collection of practices that become culturally meaningful. Okay, because if it didn't become culturally meaningful, it maybe, not, it maybe wouldn't continue on, right? Oh, that's good. That's good. Okay, this becomes important when we start talking about authority in the life of the church. So the dictionary definition, I think I like some of the things that you all uh, have come up with already. Um, you know, a way of doing things, a mode of thought or behavior followed by a people continuously from generation to generation, a custom or usage, a body of unwritten religious precepts. Okay, that's, that's speaking to religious tradition, like a wedding, for example. Um, good. It's a way of doing things. What are, what's a tradition that we have at First Baptist Church that is not in the Bible? Communion every Sunday, first Sunday of the month. Yeah. Okay, the frequency of communion. And the date. The date, yeah. Doesn't it say somewhere in the Bible it's on the first Sunday of the month? I think so. The book of Hesitations, Hesitations chapter 1. Good. Communion. What's another one? The way we organize our services. Okay, the way we organize our services. Call to worship. Some songs. Songs gradually becoming slower as we go along. Elder prayer. Sermon. That's, that's the right way. Okay, what else? Order of service. What about Sunday school? Is Sunday school, is it in the Bible, thou shalt have Sunday school? What would happen if we tried to take it away? Ooh. What about styles of music? Yeah. Baptism? Yeah. How many remember the first time somebody brought a guitar into your drum? Do you remember the very first Sunday you had a guitar in your service? Did it create some issues? You bet it did. Uh, drums. Drums were the... Guess who the guy was who was most against the drums when they came to his church? Who almost didn't go to that church because they had a set of drums? This guy. The drummer. I had big issues with the drums come. Oh, man, what's next? What's next? You got to cut us some slack. You got to cut us some slack. Yeah, so all of these things are not biblical, but they very much become a way of doing church. They become tradition. Christmas Eve services. Um, 
So, we treat these things, um, what I want to say about this, this is about things we do that are completely separate from Scripture. Uh, traditions of the church will typically fall under one of these headings, but um, we wouldn't say that they're necessarily infallible, would we? Okay, let's keep going. Uh, time-honored practice or a set of such practices. It'd be like the um, uh, president taking the oath of office. Okay, so this is all about tradition. So, let's keep going. There's two types of tradition that mainly occur in church history. And these are, these were, um, a guy named Keith Madison are the, is the one that came up with these, these two classifications of church tradition. There's tradition one, which is a, a summary, it's defined this way, a summary of Christian orthodoxy that has been held by the universal-slash-Catholic Church since its inception. It is infallible only because it accurately represents Scripture. If it does not accurately represent Scripture, it is not true tradition. Therefore, it is subject to the Scripture, often referred to as the regula fide. Now, that's a phrase. We'll unpack it more as we go. But what does this mean? So can somebody tell me what is a summary of Christian orthodoxy that maybe we reference from time to time? The creed, creed, exactly. Something like, and what would be an example of a creed? Nicene Creed is a good one. Apostles' Creed is another one. Those are two really (coughs) common ones. And these are summaries of what Christians believe. Um, But let me ask this, would anybody say that they are infallible? Yes or no? I see a no in the back. No up front. front. Yeah, infallible, if you define infallible, it means incapable of making mistakes or being wrong. Well, we are all so if a man wrote them, then then yes. Okay. If you know what I mean. So we wouldn't necessarily say they're infallible. Would we say that they're true? Okay, now this is where it gets interesting, because we think they're true, um, but yet not necessarily infallible. So, if we say something is true, for example, if I were to say that Jesus bore the penalty of our sin, making his righteousness available to us all, by means of grace through faith. That's how we attain salvation. Would you say that was true? Would you say that's infallible? But it's not scriptural. Because I'm summarizing, aren't I? Is there a verse that says it just the way I did? So this is the idea of authority, that these creeds, are true in as far as they are true to the Scriptures. But it's good, but you see the tension here, right? It's good that we hesitate in calling something infallible, that it's without error. That would be interpretation. It would be interpretation. It It would be. It is an interpretation of, and and I'm glad you're bringing this up, because now you're seeing the, uh, the intersection of how interpretation and authority come together. Because the reason these creeds were written was because people were interpreting the Bible very differently. And if the Bible was written with one meaning in mind, why are different groups coming to different ideas of what the meaning is? And then who should have the final authority to say which interpretation is correct? Yes, Brian. So this is how, if you, so let's look at that definition again. That's how they get around it. If it does not, um, if it does not accurately represent uh, Scripture, it is not true tradition. 
So, and I, and I, think, I think I'm getting to your question here. You get, around the, you get around having to use that infallibility word with the creeds by saying it's only true in as far as it's true to the scriptures. Now, what was the second part about the uh, differences between the interpretations? Well, from different translations. Okay. So, like some of the more modern translations almost sound like paraphrasing. Yes. It's, it's yeah. Yeah. So, is it at what point is it no longer infallible when it becomes a paraphrase? That's a great question. That's a great question. Um, and I think that's what we're just going to struggle with as we go along here. Because it's, it's, it's right, you know, at, at when do they go too far in paraphrasing to the point where you really do, you, you start to lose the authorial intent? It wasn't that the Living Bible where they kind of... It's a paraphrase. The Living Bible's one, the other one, what was the... Um, the message? Yeah. Yes? But your definition says that accurately represents. So it's a paraphrase is a representation. So then there's, again, a more interpretation that comes in. Does it accurately represent? Correct. That's it. And we would say that it's true in as far as it accurately represents what it is the scriptures are saying. That's the, I hate to say those are the weasel words, but that's, that's true, you know. Because it could be as 300 years... So Nicene Creed was written in 325 A.D. So far in 1,700 years, nobody's come up with something better. Now, in 1,500 years, could it be they un unearthed something that would offer a corrective to the Nicene Creed? It's possible. But what about in 1,500 years where they come up with a corrective to the book of Ephesians? Now we're talking about something different, aren't we? So, um, but we have, uh, and it's good to hesitate. You know, traditions are not necessarily bad. Uh, and for example, the word Trinity, we believe that God is triune. But you don't see the word Trinity or triune. They are not words that occur anywhere in the Bible. You know, those words were constructed to describe God as being three persons. But they had to be coined. They had to, someone had to come up with those. There was actually a guy named Tertullian that came up with the term Trinity a few hundred years after the scriptures, um, after the time of Christ. But you see it all through the Bible. The Father in the Old Testament is God. Jesus is God. In Acts 2, uh, the Spirit comes. So we say that God is triune. However, that comes by tradition. So I think, I know personally, I was really uncomfortable with the idea of tradition until you start seeing how often it actually comes up in our faith. Um, so we have traditions that we have and hold on to. And even what I said about the gospel, you know, that was my summary of the gospel message. And when I share the gospel, I, I'll use scriptures, but I always summarize what the scriptures are saying. I illustrate what the scriptures are saying. And that's helpful, I believe, to... To most of us. How many of us were saved just from reading the Bible? Almost none of us. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't, no hands went up. Somebody explained to us and summarized what the scriptures were saying. So we see that tradition and these summaries are part. So that is uh, tradition one. Okay, that's the idea of tradition one. It's very much part of Protestantism and what we do. Then there's tradition two, the second. Second definition, and it's described this way. An infallible, unwritten body of material. Now, this is important. Listen carefully. An infallible, unwritten body of material that contains information beyond that which is contained in Scripture. For example, Marian dogmas and infallibility of the Pope. Does anybody know what is a Marian dogma? So, so the Roman Catholic Church believes for example, in the perpetual virginity of, of Mary. Um, that Mary never sinned. Those are Marian dogmas. And that the Pope has infallibility, that the words of the Pope can be as authoritative as, as Scripture. This tradition began with the apostles' teaching and is passed on through a succession of bishops. It is only revealed when issues arise that make it necessary 
for a pope or a council to speak authoritatively from this, and this is an important word, this deposit of information often referred to as living tradition. So what does this, what's this mean? Yeah, sort of. Yeah, like the, when the Pope said that being gay was and okay. Was like, oh, it's all cool. And that one's a little more like, that one's a little more questionable. Um, it, it's, it's probably maybe easier to think of it. It makes more sense to think of it, I think, this way. Um, so first of all, as Protestants, we're mainly for tradition one, not this tradition two. This is what Protestants are going to struggle with. And tra- tradition, too, it took time to develop. But think, think of this for a moment. Um, we talked a little bit about the Pope, right? The idea of the Pope is the, the person that came after. It's like the tradition of Peter. Peter disciples someone who disciples someone who disciples someone who disciples someone. And those, that line of disciples became the chain of the Popes. And there was always going to be someone else in that succession. The folks that adhered to this early on, they also believed that, um, that Jesus' primary ministry was to who? His disciples. That's who his, his um, ministry was primarily to. And among them, he had some that he, were, he was more close to, John and Andrew and Peter. He was probably more close to them. John was the disciple whom Jesus loved, according to John. So they saw this system that these early apostles, they held weight. They knew things. They were were given information that they passed on. And who would you say is um, closer to the teaching of Christ? Someone who was discipled directly by Peter or Andrew or someone that came along 1,500 years or 2,000 years later? Who had more correct teaching? Maybe the person that came just a couple of... Maybe the person whom Peter discipled. Or maybe another person removed, you know, like the the grandparent, the grandchild disciple of of Peter. And what if you came to Christ, not by reading one of Paul's letters, but because Peter himself led you to the Lord? So that person would have a certain level of authority in the church, someone that close to Peter. Peter. You know, being discipled by a disciple. So you got extra authority by virtue of being a disciple of Christ. The writings these guys had was canonized. So you were more right if you fell into that line that uh, went by the disciples. And this is how we end up with something like tradition too. So remember, in that very early church, they didn't have full Bibles. So they were reliant on people who seemed to be close to those disciples who were taught by those disciples and individuals held authority. Somebody needed to have, like somebody needed to be minding the store, right? Someone needed to know what they were talking about. I mean, you had a, a Paul just wrote a letter to a church over there and a letter to a church over there, but but like who really knows what's going on here? Well, these disciples and and the next generation of disciples. So they're working with scripture, but the emphasis was changing. And People needed to have authority. They needed to know what was... We're getting past somebody's bedtime here. So this was the sense of tradition, too, that you had disciples who had authority that were teaching, and ultimately that teaching became Scripture. But the Scriptures wouldn't be canonized. In other words, the Scriptures themselves uh, would be identified as the Bible until like another couple of hundred years. Yes, Al? Well, so- Okay, so the question is, as the apostles spread out, were they teaching something different? Yeah, I mean, I mean, once, I, I, I'm, I don't want to sound crickets. Just got lost in translation. Yeah, so, so like, people will say St. Peter, and then that leads to something else. You know, uh, St. Mary, that will lead to something else. And the, uh, the coming together of all that. Yeah. So, yeah, well, I think, so, yeah, the question is, 
are all these different perspectives of what was going on among these disciples. Was it getting mixed up, so to speak? So, yeah, I, I think that you're really driving to the question of why we're asking the questions and studying what we're studying right now, is we're asking, do, is there fidelity in what we have written now compared to what it was they were teaching and writing then, and how do we know that? So just hang on to that question. All right. We are slowly unpacking that as we go along. Yeah, good question, though. So let's talk about then... Um, about this uh, rule of faith, this regula fide. Um, and let me just read what's in the box, and we'll talk about it for a minute. This is a Greek phrase used often in the early church to refer to the summation of the Christian faith. The regula fide was seen as faith, and this is really important, faith which was held always, everywhere, and by all. So if the church is going to continue until Christ comes back, right, the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. That means that there is going to be a stream of right teaching that continues, preserved by the Holy Spirit, until Christ returns. So that is this stream of, you could call it a stream of orthodoxy, but that which has been believed and held always, everywhere, and by all. It was seen as being inherited and passed on, not through an avenue of inspired or infallible information distinct from that of Scripture, but as representative of the essential doctrinal and moral elements of the faith contained in the Bible. So this would be the, uh, the summation of the Christian faith. And if you ever read one of the early church fathers, it may something, say something like, um, there's a heretic over there. That heretic is not seeing our faith according to the rule of faith. In other words, this guy over here is believing and saying different things than we all than what we all believe to be true. We got a problem with that. Um, they would say someone is not is wrong, not because the scriptures say they're wrong, but because this rule of faith says they're wrong. Is, he said, oh, you're, you know, you didn't, they didn't give him the authority that he really had. Well, they, yeah, because they, they missed him, right? They were blinded. Scripture said they were blinded by Satan, as a matter of fact, for missing him. So they, uh, yeah, but the Jews, the Jews had a Bible, didn't they? They had a collection of scriptures. At the time, it wasn't the Old Testament, it was just the Bible. And they couldn't. They were so caught up in their traditions that they missed Christ. They missed who he was. They were blinded by their own sin. He wasn't what they expected. In the Old Testament, obviously most people were illiterate at that time. And you read about how the church repeatedly messed this up. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, if you mean the writings themselves of, yeah, I mean, this would have been the scrolls that they kept in the temples. This would have been with the, uh, the scrolls they kept in the synagogues, or the words of the prophets. Um, obviously, they started out with the, the Torah, the first five books, and they had scrolls of prophets that they kept in there as well. So you had a whole collection of scrolls that they would get out and read portions of. Uh, so yeah, the, the written spoken word was extremely important in Jewish in Jewish worship. Yeah. They still screwed it up. They still screwed it up. And the teachers, I mean, they were the worst ones. You know, the ex, remember that? Ex, that's why the New Testament is littered with that phrase the experts in the law. The experts in the law, the Pharisees, they are the ones that should have thrown up their arms and say, hey, Jesus is here, but they missed it. And they should have been the, one, the ones yelling the loudest. Yeah. Okay, I'm starting to preach. Good question. Okay, so um, 
So this regular fide, this rule of faith, that is what they would consider to be the right interpretations of the Scriptures that were believed by everyone, always, everywhere. That's this rule of faith. Tradition one would say what about this rule of faith? How would they interpret the regular fide? Well, they would probably say it's just Scripture in summary form. That's this rule of faith. Tradition, too, would say it's a totally separate source because because they aren't using Scripture. They're using a separate source. Okay? Um, So... The way the world is now? Just like the basic, you know, uh, always, everywhere, everybody always. Not a big deal. Well, I, no, I would, well, I would say that the world now wouldn't be willing to acknowledge there's any kind of central truth. Yeah. You know, I would say they wouldn't. Well, that would be, this would be foreign. They would not like, you know, the world as they will not accept any kind of a universal dogmatic truth. Right, that's kind of what I would. Yeah, that's good for you. Okay. You can, you can. Believe that, and I'll believe what I believe. And you have to respect what I believe. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I, that was my interpretation of what you said. No, I, no, what I meant was like, you know, there's the, they don't, it doesn't matter to them anymore what it's, what it's like, the rule of faith. It, it just do whatever you want. Whatever oh, yeah, there is no rule of faith. Right. Yeah, it, it's like that's, yeah, postmodernism won't really accept a rule of faith. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right on. Um, okay, so, so someone may well say what I believe is the Bible. Well, that would not have been good enough because lots of people said that and you still didn't know what they believed. It's still that way to some degree. Some may say that they believe the Bible, but they, you know, every, uh, every, every church in Sheridan would probably say, hey, we believe the Bible. But we all come up with very different meanings in what the Bible's saying. Back then, they would say if it was outside the rule of faith, it wasn't true. That's why you didn't have multiple denominations at the time, because everyone subscribed to this rule of faith. What they believed was the right interpretation of the Bible. Any questions on that? I think we'll go for one more, one more slide here. We'll do a solo ecclesia. So the Greek word for church is ekklesia. So when you see that word ekklesia, it's talking about the church. So this, is, this would be translated the church alone. It's the belief that tradition, notice capital T, represented by the magisterial authority of the Roman Catholic Church. What would the magisterial authority of the Roman Catholic Church be? It'd be the Pope and... The cardinals or the the bishops is infallible and equal to scripture as a basis for doctrine. It is the final authority in all matters of faith and practice since it must define and interpret scripture. So um, this magisterial, you could call the teaching authority, has this, um, this power. And this is the institution... This, they would say the institution produces the rule of faith, that the church produces the rule of faith. It was the councils and creeds that produced it, and uh, that the church has the authority to interpret the Bible. They, they, the, the church will tell you and have the final say in what the Bible means. And uh, you can look at it one more slide, and then we'll stop here. So this is a, a way of thinking of solo ecclesia, solo ecclesia. Um, Jude 1, 3, contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. So that once for all entrusted to the saints, that is this deposit of faith that we're talking about. This is what was given to the disciples, to the apostles, what is inside that circle. And that's what needs to get passed on. Well, in that top line, you've got the Catholic Church. What do you notice about that line? It's solid. So that solid line 
uh, indicates that the church had the right interpretation all along and has continued to have it all along. That's why there's a, a, uh, the unwritten, infallible tradition that they had the right interpretation that was, that was infallible. Now, what do you notice about that bottom line? It's broken. Why is it broken? Until about the, uh, there's a timeline at the very bottom, so it's broken all until around the year 300 A.D. Why is it broken? Okay, not necessarily because there wasn't a creed yet. It's because the canon had not yet been formed. It was word of mouth. It was, you know, some letters from Paul that had gone to different places. And if the New Testament is just kind of floating around out there, so if that's the case, where are people going to go for right teaching about Jesus? To the Catholic Church. They're going to go to the church. The people who have the authority. Like the people who were discipled by the disciples. You know, we have writings from guys like Polycarp, uh, who was like, some people think he was... Um, Discipled directly by Paul? Do Polycarp's writings hold weight with people? They do. But that doesn't necessarily make them scripture. But you have, but somebody's got to know what's going on. So that was the church. And that's why the, the solid line, the church defines and interprets what the Bible's saying. Like, what does begotten mean? What does it mean that Jesus was the begotten Son of God? The church in Nicaea, the, the, the creed, the council of Nicaea said, well, he's eternally begotten. So this church council was making the decisions on how to interpret the Bible. And that was giving them, they believe, this authority. So that's what it means, the, um, that's what it means, the sola, sola ecclesia, that the church alone has this power. And, and just let me ask one more question. Does that make sense to you why they would do this? Yeah, I, I, it kind of does. Um, you know, Paul writes to Ephesus, and then Paul dies, and all they have is that letter that Paul wrote. So that church would have something to pass along to the other churches. They would compile all these letters. So the church had a more authoritative role before the canon was put together. It's not like there was some evil man behind the curtain just making these things happen. It was like they were just sincerely trying to get the right teaching into the hands of the next generation of people. Was it a group of people? It was the people in the churches. What if one guy disagreed? Well, they would judge his disagreement against the regula fide, the rule of faith. It's a good question. That's what Luther did. Yeah, but Luther had the Bible on his side. That's what separated Luther from some of these other folks. Yes, Gary. Yes, yeah, these are like early commentaries, a lot of them. You could think of it that way. Uh, they were summarizing what the Bible taught. Yeah. We got to stop because we're, we're at 8.15 here. Is this making some sense? Yes. Good, good. We're diving into the deep end, people. It's late. I get all excited about it. I love, I love teaching this. This is so fun. Um, unpacking this. Let me pray for us. God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for what it means. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to engage our minds as we unpack these deep truths about yourself. It's the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So next week we will pick up on, um, what page are we on in the notes? Six? We made it all the way to page six. <laughs> we'll pick up there next time. <clears throat> Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I have more questions now than I have when I got back. Good. We want more questions. Keep them. <laughs>